Hi guys, how are you doing? Hopefully everything is okay. We have our next online class today. <clears throat> Let's see, some people are still joining. Okay, I got that other who would like to join, they will join us a bit later. And uh, if you have any questions regarding some physics concepts you don't understand, you're welcome to ask me. Uh, I think that we, before we go to the next uh, topic, which is dynamics and like laws of motion. I just would like shortly recall you what we uh, did uh, yesterday, like not like yesterday, last time, and uh, just show how we can solve this problem using uh, a bit uh, like different approach, uh, which I believe would be interesting and useful to. Uh, diversify a bit your approaches uh, to these kind of uh, questions. Okay, so let me change the screen. Okay, so let us continue our discussion about this uh, case of uh, rotating uh, wheel where we have a combination of motion like straight line motion along one dimension and a uniform uh, circular motion and we figure out that the total uh, velocity with respect to ground uh, will be V, we're calling V prime, equal to two uh, V naught multiply cosine uh, P divided by two. So let's have this uh, drawing again for our reference. And here is angle phi. This is our point we're interested in, in given moment of time. So this is uh, linear velocity, which by module is equal to the uh, velocity of uh, spinning, uh, like a rotating uh, wheel along the uh, straight line. And we got some uh, residual, some, some resultant velocity with respect to uh, ground and uh, that was uh, some velocity which is v prime so this is the way how we calculated and we got this equation by uh, adding vectors so we were considering components of uh, linear velocity on uh, x axis and also uh, y axis and then by adding uh, all these uh, velocity vectors, we got equation uh, which is shown here. Uh, however, so by analyzing this uh, equation, we figure out that there are two kind of interesting points where, for instance, in the top, when phi is equal to zero, we have maximum velocity, which is uh, two v naught because we add two velocities uh, of linear uh, velocity of uh, uniform circular motion and also of uh, uh, 
velocity along straight line of rotating wheel. And also this other reference point, which is kind of interesting, where we have uh, two velocities uh, cancel each out and uh, each other, and uh, we have zero uh, velocity uh, with respect to ground. So let us take this into account. And if this point here is uh, has velocity with respect to the ground equal to uh, zero, then we can uh, introduce such a term as instantaneous axis of rotation. So uh, let's say we have the same wheel. So now we assume that uh, this in the bottom is our instantaneous axis of rotation, which is uh, perpendicular to the plane of the uh, image. And uh, let's say this is our radius. This is angle B. Here is our point. So the radius of rotation about this instantaneous uh, axis of rotation will be this one. So let's, in order to be more uh, clear, let's point, like name these points, A, uh, B, C, and D. So now D is a uh, uh, point from through which our uh, instantaneous uh, axis of rotation goes through. And uh, now with respect to this new radius, which is going to be time dependent, so it will change from two radius from diameter in point A uh, to zero in point D. So you see that this uh, radius uh, DB uh, will change its length over time. Uh, but uh, the uh, axis of rotation will be constant. So since here we have one radius and here we have another radius, angle here will be phi divided by two. So it will be twice smaller than phi. And the length of this instantaneous axis, uh, instantaneous uh, uh, of this radius uh, uh, of rotation around the instantaneous axis will be equal, let's write it, db uh, is equal to, uh, so here we have a right angle triangular, db, and that's why the lens of this uh, side, uh, adjacent side to this uh, angle phi divided by two will be uh, db equal to two uh, r, two radius. This is uh, distance between points A and D. Multiply cosine phi divided by two. Since uh, this point B, which is uh, in given moment of time, is interesting for us, uh, is connected with both normal radius and this instantaneous radius. The angular velocity of uh, rotations around the uh, center of the wheel and around the instantaneous axis of rotation will be equal. So we can write that omega uh, around uh, axis, which goes through point C equal to omega around uh, like of uh, rotation about axis, which uh, goes uh, around point uh, through the point D. If these two uh, angular velocities are equal, then we can uh, write that the ratio, so angular velocity is the ratio in general here, let's write 
is equal to velocity divided by radius. We discussed this equation on previous classes. And uh, now we can write that uh, omaha, oops, sorry, not omaha, but now we go from omaha to uh, linear velocity. V naught, which is the linear velocity of uh, uh, uniform circular motion divided by R, by this radius between points C and B, is equal to some uh, linear velocity, some, some velocity V prime, which is that one which we were looking for. So with respect to the ground, divided by the length, by the radius of this uh, instantaneous radius of uh, rotation about the instantaneous axis of uh, rotation. And this radius, as we already described here, is dB. And this is equal to V prime divided by 2R multiplied cosine V divided by 2. So from here, we can cancel out this radius and get the equation for V prime, which is equal to V naught cosine V divided by 2. And you see that this equation is the same as that one which we got yesterday on the previous um, online class uh, by just adding vectors of uh, uh, all velocities. So this is another approach when you have some uh, point on the body where, which moves and uh, its velocity is equal to zero with respect to certain system of coordinates then you can apply this uh, approach of instantaneous um, axis of rotation and can be uh, beneficial to solve certain uh, problems uh, which uh, can be solved just applying some geometry, basic geometry rules. Okay, professor. Yes. Uh can you please repeat uh, why the angular velocities at points C and D are equal? I yeah. didn't get this point. Good, thank you for your question. So you see that uh, this point uh, B on the wheel is connected with both, um, with the, uh, both uh, radiuses. Uh, normal radius, which is radius of the wheel uh, CB, and also this instantaneous radius, which is dB. Since it is connected, once this point makes one rotation around this circle and comes back to this initial position, both of these radiuses will make the same uh, one rotation. They will come back again to this point B because they are attached to this point. That's why as many times per second, radius CB will make rotation, uh, as many uh, like revolutions per, per second. That will be equal to the same number of revolution per second for radius DB. The only difference uh, is that um, radius CB is constant. It doesn't change because we don't uh, change the shape of our wheel but radius of this instantaneous radius, it will uh, change in length. So it will change from uh, 2R, which is a distance between point A and D, and to uh, zero when it will be uh, just point D, so when uh, it's in the bottom of the circle. But uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah. So th that means that their frequencies are like equal. So that's what. Yes, exactly. So angular frequency is equal to uh, two pi multiply uh, frequency. So two pi is a constant and f its frequency. F or also can be uh, denoted as nu 
Uh, so it's equal to one divided by T, uh, capital T. And capital T, in this case, it's um, period of rotation. So the period of rotation uh, means the time which takes point B to travel uh, 360 degrees and come back to its initial position uh, will be the same for radius CB and radius DB. Okay, thank you, got it. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Uh, what is, there's a question, what is instantaneous radius? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a radius uh, about the instantaneous axis of rotation, which is in our case, uh, now on this image goes uh, perpendicular to point uh, D. So it goes in the plane uh, perpendicularly in the plane of our uh, image. And uh, in this given moment of time, instantaneous radius of uh, rotation is the line between points D and B. D and B. Mr. Bruce? Yes? How can we conclude that uh, dB is equal to radius, the second dB? Uh, how we can conclude that dB, so you mean this uh, equation? Yes. Okay, so that comes from uh, the right angle triangular, uh, which is d point D here, A and B. It is, it is right triangular, eh? Yes. And that's why we have here this angle uh, phi divided by two. So the adjacent, so this is hypotenuse, two R, the diameter of the, uh, wheel, and this uh, dB is adjacent cat, cut, like, and that's why adjacent, lens of adjacent cut it, or adjacent uh, uh, side of this triangular will be uh, hypotenuse, like a d, which is 2 r multiply uh, cosinus of this angle phi divided by 2. Okay, so now let us go further. And this is um, next step in our course, we go to dynamics. As you may remember, uh, we uh, were working at the beginning, I described that we are going to work at the first stage on kinematics. And this is the um, field of study when we want to know where, where the body will be over some interval of time, um, we need to describe its motion, a change of coordinate, its velocity, acceleration, but we didn't ask uh, the question, what is the reason for this motion? And uh, dynamics, it's actually the Mm, like moment when we start asking uh, what is the reason for, for this motion. And uh, uh, there are three, I'm sure you heard about them, there are three laws of motion, so-called Newton's laws. laws. And uh, um, let maybe start with the first one, and then I will add some additional information which is relevant. Um, so you will uh, understand it uh, better. So our first law of motion could be defined as and uh, postulated. So keep in mind, so all these laws of motion are not derived from anything. So it's a result of many experiments and just uh, observations of, of nature and how, how things respond to different, uh, under different conditions. Uh, also, these laws of motion 
they are applicable for classical mechanics, so they have limited domain of uh, mm, limited uh, domain of applicability, uh, and uh, uh, they cannot be applied to objects which are moving very fast, close to speed of light. Uh, they cannot be applied to very little, small objects, uh, which are comparable to atoms. So that is already uh, relativity and uh, uh, quantum mechanics, respectively. Uh, so these laws of motion, they since, again, they were not derived, they were postulated based on everyday uh, life experience, that is something what is uh, relevant to uh, the conditions which we experience in, in our life. So not too small objects and not too high speeds. So the first law of motion can be postulated in the following form. Um, in the inertial um, frame of reference, which we will come back a bit to this point to clarify this, uh, in the inertial frame of reference, uh, free or quasi free body cannot experience any acceleration. So what means free or quasi free body? So free body is a body which um, doesn't have any uh, force applied on it. So, ze so zero forces are applied. And uh, quasi-free, it's when forces are applied, but they're applied in that way that they compensate each other, because force is a um, uh, vector uh, quantity. So if these forces are applied in that way that they compensate each other, we can claim that this uh, body is quasi-free. And in this case, so let's maybe write it down, it will be sum of all forces applied to this body. Uh, maybe let's write like this. If the sum of all forces applied to this body is equal to zero, then uh, the velocity of this body in the inert system, like reference, uh, uh, inert frame of, of reference, uh, will be equal either to zero, so it will be stationary, or uh, it will be equal to some constant value. And uh, also, it's good to write here vectors, actually, because uh, it means that we have no change in uh, absolute value. And also, no change in uh, direction. So what does it mean? That in this uh, inertial frame of um, reference, if all applied forces are canceled out or they are just not applied, uh, this body will, uh, if it has some given velocity, it will continue moving in along the straight line and without any change of velocity. So in order to move with constant velocity, no change in absolute value, no change in direction, you don't need to apply any force. So it can happen by itself. So let us, as I mentioned uh, above, let us come back to clarify what is inert, inertial frame of reference. Uh, that is kind of, in some extent, kind of imaginary frame of reference, because all real frames of references are in more or less uh, deviate, they deviate more or less from this ideal uh, condition. So let us assume that we have one system of coordinates, x and why? And it is not moving. It just has zero velocity. It's stationary. 
And then let us consider another system of coordinates. X, I don't know, let's call it prime and Y prime. And this uh, system of coordinates, uh, let's uh, call it K prime, and this will be K. So a uh, system of coordinates K prime moves with respect to this stationary uh, system of coordinates K uh, with some constant velocity V naught. And uh, this is uh, along axis X. So it doesn't have any acceleration. So this V naught is constant. And this is vector. It means it's constant in both absolute value and also in the direction. Then let us consider some body here. It can be defined with respect to the mobile uh, system of coordinates k prime with radius vector uh, r, uh, or maybe not from this side, it will be crowded. Uh, let's call it r2. then the system, the origin of this mobile system of coordinate can be defined with respect to the mob, immobile system of coordinate with radius um, R0. Then probably we don't call it R2, it will be confusing. So this radius vector, let's call it R prime. And then the position of this body with respect to immobile system of coordinates K will be given by radius vector R. So you see that radius vector R is equal to the sum of two vectors. It is uh, R0 uh, plus R prime. So keep in mind that all of these uh, radius vectors, they, they are functions of, of time. So they are changing over time. So in order to get the um, velocity, we need to take first derivative of our radius vector as we did before. So let's write this dr equal to dt uh, over dt equal to r naught dr naught over dt plus dr prime over dt. So this can be written like v which is velocity of our body, let's call it body A, uh, with respect to uh, immobile system of coordinate K, will be equal to the velocity V naught of our mobile system of coordinate K prime with respect to the immobile one, and plus uh, some V uh, prime which is velocity of our body A with respect to the mobile system of coordinate K prime. So this is uh, clear and that is, we need to take this into account that if we have uh, some, I don't know, let's consider some train and uh, if a person goes along the train, so with respect to the ground, we will add velocities of the train. In our case, it's V naught, the velocity of the mobile system of coordinate to the um, velocity of our, uh, of this person moving with respect to the train. So this is quite clear. And 
Now let's take the second derivative uh, of uh, this equation which describes the uh, velocity. So it will be d v over dt equal d v naught over dt plus d v prime over dt. So what do we have? We know that this v naught we have this condition stated at the beginning is constant. So it doesn't change with time. So it means that this derivative is equal to zero. And from here, we can write that acceleration of our body with respect to the immobile system of coordinate equal to its acceleration a prime with respect to the mobile system of coordinate. So from these two equations, we see that velocity is not, so it's called invariant, uh, so, sorry, it's called variant parameter. So it changes uh, if we consider velocity of the body with respect, with respect to uh, mobile and immobile system of coordinates. But acceleration is invariant parameter. So it doesn't change. Why it doesn't change? Because with respect to this immobile system of coordinate k, a k prime which moves, moves with constant velocity. It doesn't have any acceleration. So uh, when system of, uh, let's say, uh, inertial system or uh, system of reference is that system of reference which doesn't move with any acceleration with respect to another inertial system of reference. And uh, that's why uh, acceleration in all inertial system or uh, frames of references remains uh, invariant parameter. Because if we have some acceleration of this uh, uh, system of reference, our uh, first law of motion and second law of motion, they will not work because there will be some additional force originated from the acceleration of system of reference in within which our body is moving. And that's why it will um, violate the laws of motion in their definition. That's why uh, if we really need to have an inertial frame of reference or system of reference, depends how you call it. But so Earth's surface is not really a good um, example for that. Because uh, do you have an idea why surf, uh, earth, surface of the Earth is not a good uh, reference, uh, inertial example of inertial uh, system of reference? Does anyone has an idea? Uh, keep in mind that Earth is not immobile in space. So it spins, uh, it ro spins around, like rotates about its own axis of uh, rotation. That's why we have changes in day and night. And also it rotates around the uh, sun. So. All of these motions, they originate in some uh, centrosypical uh, accelerations. And that's why if you stay on the surface of the Earth, in most cases, you uh, experience both of them. And uh, it's not inertial frame of reference. So uh, some ideal, ideal case would be if you Point, if you locate the origin of system of coordinates in the center of mass uh, of our solar system and then direct the axis 
towards some stars which are very far away from, from us. And that's why uh, they are considered that with some approximation can be considered immobile with respect to the center of uh, mass of solar system. In that case, uh, this would be some kind of ideal uh, inertial frame of reference. Uh, and any frame of reference which moves with constant velocity or is stationary with respect of this ideal inertial frame of reference will be also inertial frame of reference because this condition that acceleration remains uh, invariant parameter will be true. So this is definition of this inertial uh, frame of, of reference. So let us go further. So with the first law of motion, more or less, everything is clear now. Let's go to the second law of motion. So again, in the um, inertial frame of reference, if there is some resultant force, I don't put this sign of the uh, sum. It's since now it's clear that we need to consider the sum of all forces and then get some resultant force which is applied to the uh, um, body. So with this resultant, uh, if we have some resultant forms, uh, force applied to the body, then uh, it is equal to uh, M multiply A. So M is mass and A is acceleration. So both A and force are vectors. So we just multiply uh, vector um, A by M as a constant, some, some number. So this is kind of very important law of motion. Let us discuss it a bit in more details. Uh, sometimes it's written in a different form. It's written like A is equal to F divided by M. And some people claim that this is a right form to uh, define the second law of motion because acceleration is the result of acting by this force. So we need to consider force divided by M um, will cause this acceleration A. But somehow it's very common to write it as uh, I wrote it first, F is equal to M multiply A. Okay, so it actually partially comes from the first law of motion because we knew that if uh, resultant force is equal to zero, then velocity should be equal to uh, some constant value. So if this is true, then the derivative of velocity over time, which is acceleration, also equal to zero because derivative of the constant is equal to zero. However, if this force is not equal to zero, then this uh, force will be proportional to the change of velocity and means proportional to acceleration. There is just missing only one uh, parameter like coefficient m, which mass. So this mass is, uh, is a measure of inertial of, of the body. Uh, so it describes how much any body uh, refuses or acts again this force in terms of refuses to be accelerated by this force. So the larger mass, uh, the smaller acceleration while you apply the same force. Uh, so let us consider more these two parameters, mass and acceleration. 
First of all, how would you measure acceleration? So do you have an idea if it's necessary to do this measurement for you? Uh, how would you approach this task? Any ideas from you guys? Excuse me, the question is about measuring the acceleration? Yeah, the question, how would you measure acceleration? What, what would you use in your experiment and how would you design this experiment? Actually, maybe we can use, uh, we can measure somehow the change in velocity. Uh, yeah. At the proper time. Uh, and let's say, find the nature. Yeah, okay. So let's say we, we uh, have some axis X, one dimension. Then we, our body is moving along this axis X. And let's say in time, uh, T1, we measure velocity, what it has here, it will be V1. And then we, in some time interval, T2, we measure another velocity, V2. And then acceleration is V2 minus V1 divided by T2 minus T1. So this is how we could, uh, measure acceleration and this the short is this time interval like delta t the closer we will be to instantaneous acceleration so this is the way the approach how we would go for to measure acceleration if we need to do it um, or as an option we can just attach a smartphone to this body and uh, if most of your smartphones uh, have these accelerometers embedded, and then you could get the number without necessity to do any calculations. By the way, someone has an idea how accelerometers in your smartphone, smartphones works? Mm -hmm. So it actually has some mass of like known mass and uh, some small metal sphere. And in three directions, it has either piezoelectric or capacitive sensors. So piezoelectric is a crystal which produces certain voltage when you press it in certain direction. Uh, and uh, cap capacitive sensors is when you have two electrodes and uh, some dielectric, but this dielectric is kind of soft. So if you press it, press it a little bit, so you change the thickness, so the distance between two electrodes, and that will cause the change in capacitance of this sensor. And you have these sensors in three directions. That's why every time you move your smartphone, this uh, mass is pushing with certain force on these uh, sensors. These sensors are calibrated for this change of voltage in piezoelectric case or change of capacitance in the capacitor sensors uh, for different forces. So if you get certain change in capacitance, you know that some given force is applied to this sensor. And since you know this force and you know the mass of this uh, reference small uh, body in the sensor, uh, you can calculate the acceleration because uh, force is equal to mass multiplied acceleration. So this is most of accelerometers in electronic devices. They are based on such type of, of sensors. Uh, okay, so with acceleration, we clarify it so we can measure it. Let's say, what about mass? How would you measure mass. Obviously, I have, I believe that all of you kind of would recommend to use some scale. It's just obvious approach to measure mass. Uh, but 
scale measures not mass directly, it measures weight. And weight is mass multiplied g, which is uh, acceleration of free falling, or it could be considered as the strength of uh, gravitational field. And that is kind of counterintuitive to assume that the mass, uh, this, the, the parameter of the body, which describes how uh, it will be accelerated by applying some force to it, and uh, how, it, how much it will interact with gravitational field, these parameters will be equal to each other. It just happens that they are equal. So the gravitational mass is equal to uh, mass of the body. But uh, if you really think about it, it kind of responds to very different uh, uh, influences on the body. You just hit the uh, body with uh, something, you apply some mechanical force and you see how much it accelerates and then you put this body in a gravitational field and see how much it interacts with gravitational field. So kind of two very different uh, physical uh, processes are happening, but it appears that this uh, masses, gravitational mass and immerse of, uh, inertial mass is called, uh, which goes into this uh, second law of motion. Uh, they are equal, so we operate just with mass, but physically uh, there are different meanings behind these terms, uh, inertial mass and uh, gravitational mass. So keep this in mind, please. And, uh, but there is an option to measure the inertial mass. So in that case, we really need to measure acceleration. So if we have certain um, spring, which to which we attach, uh, for instance, one kilogram, which is a reference mass, we push it with some force, like pull it, and then let it go, uh, it will come back with certain acceleration. We don't know this force. It's some unknown force. But uh, this acceleration will be equal to this unknown force divided by uh, m, uh, let's say, 1, which is our uh, etalon of one kilo. Then we can, so this will be A1. Then we can put, attach here another body, which we want to measure inertial mass of. And uh, also repeat this experiment. So keep in mind that you can do this in outer space. You don't need to be on the earth. So you don't need gravitation. Only this spring and your body. So you attach uh, another to the same uh, spring. You attach another body with mass M2 and pull with the same force. So you have the same deformation of your uh, spring. So you don't need to know the force, but you can pull to the same deformation uh, of this uh, spring. And then when you let it go, it will get some acceleration A2, which is the same unknown force, divided by M2. Now, if we divide these by these, we will get like A1 divided by A2 equal to M2 divided by M1. Since we know M1, it's our reference, one kilo, we can measure, as we already described, uh, acceleration A1 and A2. From this proportion, we can easily determine the uh, inertial mass of, of our body. In this case, uh, the accelerations are equal, yeah? No, accelerations are different, but the force, this F, is equal. Because we uh, pull to the same deformation of this spring, and this force 
uh, of reaction of the spring will be equal to uh, minus kx. Uh, so k is some spring coefficient which relates the deformation with the force and x is just deformation. So if it's uh, here we have our x axis. So here is zero and then we pull it to some position here, it will be our x. So we have the same x deformation for both cases. It means applies automatically that uh, these forces F in both cases are equal. Since masses are different, accelerations will be different. But we can measure accelerations. We already discussed this. Uh, we know mass uh, M1 because it's some uh, reference mass of one kilogram, for instance. And then we can determine our uh, unknown mass two, which is inertial mass of this body, which we want to investigate in the framework of uh, second uh, law of uh, Newton's law or second law of motion. Okay. So I guess we define. Uh, Mr. Bruce? Yes. Actually, I didn't understand how can we find the uh, inertial mass if we don't know the uh, uh, inertial mass, mass two, and the accelerations. Oh, we measure acceleration. So oh, we measure it. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, so we discussed first how we can measure acceleration. So we know that we can measure acceleration. Then we do this experiment with mass one. We measure, uh, pull this spring with mass, attach mass one to certain delta x deformation. Then let it go and we measure acceleration A1. Then we change the mass. We put, instead of mass M1, we put unknown mass M2. We pull this spring again to the same deformation. So we have the same force like reaction of the uh, spring and let it go. And then when it goes by this force, which uh, exerts the uh, spring to this body M2, uh, we measure acceleration A2. So we know now A1, A2, because we measured them. We know M1 because we took the reference one kilo and in this, uh, uh, proportion A divided by A, A1 divided by two, M2 divided by M1. We don't know only M2, so we can easily determine. Is it clear? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. So I guess we are already out of time. So it's good that we managed to discuss uh, in details the second, uh, first and second laws of motion. So we will continue with the third law of motion on the uh, next online class uh, and uh, on Monday. And uh, then we will go for different examples how these laws of motion can be applied to certain systems and try to analyze different uh, examples. Okay, guys, have a good weekend. Thank you very much for attention. And see you on Monday. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you, bye. Okay, have a good weekend, bye.